In episode two of the Water Smart Dams podcast, we're getting an in-depth process of dam building from determining the right size and gradient to sealing and preventing seepage. We'll walk you through each step to ensure your dam is built to last. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of creating a reliable water source. How do you determine the size a dam is going to be usually? A combination of a few things, I suppose. It really depends on the farmer's budget and what he wants to do with the water. I usually see if I can convince them that if they've got a good catchment to put a bigger dam there. But it depends also on their, what they want the water for. Mm. And, and the usage is always higher than they expect. But depending whether the country will allow for it, you know, a bigger dam as long as the catchment's there. So once you've done the drilling, you've decided on the location, what is the next step for you in order to build the dam? Well, once we've established that the clay and the site is good, a viable site, pretty much it's um, peg and shift the overburden off the top and then clay layer it. That's what's gonna seal your dam. What's the process that you take to construct a dam? Can you talk a little bit about the gradients and the maximisation and sort of how you build out that way? Basically, your dam site, once the site's pegged, the construction site will end up a lot bigger than what, what is your pegged area or your finished. Basically, what we're doing is working to pretty much a standard of three and one batter. That's the most stable, you know, for and stock access. You can go back to about possibly two and a half in one, but that's quite steep. It gives you a reasonable depth, keep the water out of the wind, but also not too steep that you, you know, still have access to it, the water. And when we're talking about dam sealing, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, you've already established all of that when you drill it. That's your clay quality. And then it's just basically just taking floors and the machines we've got, we usually take about a metre at a time off the floor. Yeah, just line the, the walls in layers yep. and the material that's being pushed. If the clay is moist, it will compact pretty well. And there's also a little bit that factors in around the clay and obviously generally the further you move down, usually the better the clay is. Um, but there's also that 10 foot layering of clay. Can you talk a little bit about these points as well? Generally, depending on how much overburden's on top as well too, because if the overburden's too deep, there's not enough clay to seal it properly. So that's one thing I'm looking for in the dam is that the clay level is, you know, sort of up reasonably high. Mm. And most of your dam is sealed in about the first probably three metres, depending on the size of the dam. How do you actually start out accounting for seepage? What are you sort of looking for? If there's seepage, it's usually down fairly low in the dam, mm -hmm. but I would have already located that in the drilling. The water will actually come into those boreholes. Okay. And that's where I'm pulling a sample out of that. So I know that it's there. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about seepage in sandy areas, can you tell me a little bit about that? Basically, they're only a soak site, and it really depends on the recharge area above it to how much you know, seepage water you're going to get out of that site. Because some of them are just have a like reservoir of water there. And once that's used up, it's gone. So yep. basically it's, you know, you're just digging those with an excavator or you can do them with a dozer. But just uh, sandy stuff, lay the batters out pretty flat so the stock aren't carrying too much sand back in. Catchments and slit traps. Tell me a little bit about this. All right, the catchments basically we're looking at is, um, you know, what's... What, it, what water is actually running off those areas towards the dam site. We can use the reverse sides of hills sometimes and that just depends on the uh, contouring and you know if water is actually running the opposite way if that area is above the dam site it's running off a hill slope away from the dam you can run a contour around the hill mm -hmm. on the opposite slope and bring that water back and feed it into the catchment area that you're, you're working on already. The silt traps themselves are just a, generally in a storm or something, you will end up with a heap of grass and stuff like that. It's only really in a storm situation that that'll wash off paddocks. Yep. The silt traps, is, we just set them up with an inverted pipe in them, so as it, before the pipe runs, the blanket that floats on top will usually float for three, four, five hours. And so that the inlet of the pipe is you know, well below the blanket that floats on top with all the stubble and grass. The water's actually drawn from under that blanket. 
Mm. But there's a sump under the pipe in that as well for dirt and heavy material. You've gone back to watch the dams and how they sort of work in the storms. Tell me a little bit about this, why it's important and what you've sort of seen to be able to further develop them. I had to make sure that the sills and whatever we put on the end of the silt trap were able to handle the flow of water and we try and build everything to extreme situations, not just for the everyday rain. We want them to be built for storm events yep. and still be there when the, everything's finished and stopped running and, and that's why I was spending a bit of time going back and looking and seeing how it was all performing. Thank you for tuning into the Water Smart Dams podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and it gave you valuable insight into the effective water management practices that you can implement on your farm. This project is jointly funded through the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund and the Western Australian State Government's Agricultural Climate Resilience Fund.